Uh, so it's great to meet the next generation of performance-seeking computational scientists and engineers. And I'm uh, honored to have the chance to try to enlist you in some algorithmic challenges. It's sort of an artifact of schedule constraints that this uh, algorithms talk comes right after the architecture talks and right before the programming model talks. But uh, I think even though it's separated from its sister algorithm talks at the end of this week, it's very appropriate to do an algorithmic overview at this point. Um, so this talk picks up on architectural themes from Pete, Pavan, James, Nikolai, and Ray, and attempts to show how they will influence the next generation of algorithms. And I will mention several solver algorithms, but superficially with the promise that people like Kathy Yellick and James Demmel and Jack Dongara and uh, Rob Falgu and so forth will come back to talk about them uh, towards the end of the week, especially in the fast math section of the program. And I actually, uh, in accordance with Paul's instructions, just you know, noted some of the tie-ins. Uh, we're part, of course, of an interconnected ecosystem. And as architectures become more uniform at the fine scale, as we've heard today in terms of Intel Phi and NVIDIA GPU, and as applications become more irregular in the ways that you are trying to make them more adaptive and multi-physics, then that leaves a gap that uh, algorithms must be uh, constructed to fill. So you've heard some of the architectural presentations and programming models and uh, the fast math, and I would say that the tie-in of this is hopefully to all of them in some way or other. But unlike most of the others on this page, I will not be assigning any hands-on exercises. Instead, I will just be assigning thesis topics. So my uh, philosophy for software investment is uh, that of the SIDAC program of the USDOE, namely a huge number of applications largely related to uh, elliptic solves and generalized eigenvalue problems uh, stem uh, from you know, uh, molecular dynamics, quantum chemistry, ocean circulation, seismology, turbulent combustion, bioinformatics, magnetohydrodynamics, global climate. These all express themselves in a relatively gratifyingly small set of data structures and a uh, you know, relatively uh, manageable set of algorithmic kernels. And if we can build the right set of abstract interfaces and uh, very architecture-oriented optimizations of those libraries, as all the previous speakers have recommended, you know, use a library when you can find it, then we can spread the small number of experts in these various architectures and programming models over a large range of applications. And these are all applications that we work on at KAUST, but uh, they're very much uh, like the ones uh, in the uh, SIDAC program as well. Uh, since uh, I was invited, uh, this is where I spend about uh, three-fourths of my year on the shores of the Red Sea. I learned last night in the uh, introductions that most of you are hikers. We do have uh, mountains, dunes, and uh, a notable crater, but mostly we have, uh, if you're a scuba diver, that's how we really recruit you because we have several hundred miles of reefs that the Australians are quite jealous of because theirs are bleaching and ours were you know, evolved to higher temperatures in the first place. Uh, this is a little country, a little international science country, a little bit bigger than Macau, a little bit smaller than Bermuda, called Kaust. Uh, that's the, the angle from which the photo on the first page was taken, and that is the academic core of this city, which was built for sustainable technology scientific research centers, and that's the building where I live. It's called Building Number One, and it's named after Al Khwarizmi, the uh, scientist from the 800s from whose last name we get the English word algorithm, and who wrote a little book in the year 830 called Algebra, and like most words that begin with AL, uh, these are of Arabic origin, and that was at one time a center of learning and scientific, uh, really the scientific center of the world, and the goal of the late king is to, is to uh, you know, re-implement a house of learning on, uh, on that uh, part. So when we were started in 2009, uh, Siam took note of the fact, hey, this is actually maybe the first university in the world that was built around computational science and engineering rather than accidentally stumbling into computational science and engineering. We started with a top 20 supercomputer, about a quarter of the faculty are modeling oriented in their mode of scientific discovery or engineering design. Recently, we refreshed our system with a Cray XC40. It peaks at about 7.3 petaflops and uh, comes in on number seven in the latest top 500 list as well as the HPCG benchmark. Interesting you know, combination of those two. Uh, it, it has about uh, two gigaflops uh, per watt 
which is about as high as any system that is not GPU or phi based uh, and is not a blue gene. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's a lot of caveats, but, uh, you know, for, for a really easily programmable machine where you sort of, you know, compile and go uh, uh, with, a, with a very fast network, that's how Cray won the bid, nine, nine uh, vendors uh, bid for this machine. Um, it's it's uh, quite a great resource for a single university. Uh, if we compare it to the uh, Blue Gene P with which we began, um, it's about a factor of 33 more powerful. That's about right. That's the square root of 1,000. Every 10 years, you're supposed to get a, you know, a factor of 1,000. Um, and uh, nothing else keeps up, of course, with that, as we've heard in the architectural presentations. However, the, um, the uh, gigaflops per watt is improved by a factor of 5 en route to the much larger factor that we need to get to exascale. None of the other uh, parts of the architecture quite keep up with the increase in uh, the, the uh, many core uh, performance of, of the Haswell. We should probably call it multi-core, but um, uh, you know, it's a, a very a significant uh, resource for us. And uh, meanwhile, we in the Extreme Computing Research Center, we don't use this machine much. We're more interested in the GPU and the Phi directions. And the theme of my talk will be uh, this quote from Wayne Gretzky, that a good player skates to where the puck is, while a great player skates to where the puck is going to be. So I'm going to invite you while you're thinking about the applications that will enable you to earn a PhD, since you have a long career in this business and will be facing a different class of architectures that are much more power austere, you might as well you know, start building that into your agenda. So this is about algorithms for where architectures are going to be, with the caveat that such algorithms may or may not be the very best that you could run today. Uh, they may uh, for instance, do more flops in the interest of getting rid of some memory accesses or doing fewer synchronizations. And the architectural endpoints where the, where the machine balance reaches where these uh, algorithms will be superior may yet be coming in, in, uh, in some cases. But uh, it's easy to extrapolate from the uh, group that Pete mentioned, the International Exascale Software Project Roadmap, to those kind of architectures. Just to give you some examples of some of the PhD theses being written in my group today, we have something called accelerated cyclic reduction, which is a new spin on a 45-year-old algorithm, which is not optimal in any dimension higher than one, namely uh, cyclic reduction for general purpose elliptic solvers where you don't have the FFTs to reduce the sure complements. And uh, if you replace, however, that O of n squared that, that appears at every reduction in, in, in the uh, original algorithm, with a hierarchical matrix, you can drive it down to uh, order n log squared n. Or you could apply fast multipole, which is a 30-year-old O of n solver, so optimal conditioning for elliptic problems, uh, but a bad constant when used at high accuracy so that it often uh, loses to multigrid on today's systems, not just for the variable coefficients where multigrid has them as part of the operator, but even for constant coefficients where fast multipole has an explicit Green's function and should be at its best. But if you degrade it to low accuracy with small uh, polynomial expansions, uh, uh, it can be used as an excellent uh, preconditioner. Uh, asymptotically, it's going to be much better than algorithms that synchronize as often as Krylov or multigrid, we believe. Uh, there's another new algorithm by Nick Hyam called QWD, uh, QWWH SVD, which performs an order of magnitude more flops than the best uh, uh, symmetric uh, eigenvalue or SVD solver today, but uh, generates through recursion arbitrarily amounts of dynamically schedulable concurrency. And on GPUs today, it actually beats anything else uh, in scale pack, despite that huge penalty of flops. Uh, we have a, a project called MWD, Multicore Wavefront Diamond Tiling, which is a stencil evaluation library, which reduces memory pressure on these memory-starved many-core uh, processors, and actually is superior already today when you have a stencil that's complex enough to uh, you know, be memory uh, bandwidth bound. Uh, BDDC, the Balanced Domain Decomposition with Constraints, is a preconditioner that the uh, theoretical elliptic solvers community has been working on for about a decade. 
uh, which is so uh, good at reducing condition numbers, even in elliptic problems with jumping coefficients and isotropy and so forth, that um, you, you do a lot of local flops. You, every interface in your subdomain, you solve a generalized eigenproblem to build part of the preconditioner. But you only have to do a few iterations of GM res when you're done. So you save in synchronization. And all those flops come in you know, re really highly uniform uh, problems, like dense eigensolvers, for example, for the sure complements. And so it's a, it's a good uh, algorithmic direction. Finally, I will mention uh, a multiplicative Schwartz precondition in exact Newton method, which is a new nonlinear preconditioner that replaces most of the global synchronizations in a typical Newton-Krylov algorithm with local problems. So most of the synchronization is done in just local basins instead of global, and this will suit the massive concurrency of uh, future uh, networks rather well. So the background of this talk in terms of motivation is, as Pete mentioned, this, uh, this rather well-known now uh, manifesto that appeared uh, in the 2011 edition of IJHPCA with the, the we the people <laughs> of the DOE and Japanese and Chinese and European sci uh, exascale uh, uh, project leads as, uh, as the collective authors. And what we can gain, there are many things in this document, but uh, for, for the purpose of informing algorithmic development, uh, what we uh, take away is that uh, to get from today's uh, you know, 10 petaflop systems to the exaflop systems, we need two orders of magnitude performance. But with that, we need one to two more orders of magnitude of flops per watt. In other words, the efficiency must improve by a factor of approximately uh, you know, 10 to 100. Uh, this will mean a draconian reduction in the power for executing a flop, not mainly the flop itself, which is cheap, but moving the data to the flop, which will make computing and moving data less reliable because we'll off, operate much closer to the you know, signal to noise ratio, and we'll have much less space and time redundancy for resilience in the hardware. To get resilient uh, you know, computing, you either do the thing several times and vote, or, or you, uh, you know, e either in time or in space, and uh, so typical uh, ECC and other robust modes of moving data and, and computing with them uh, are today you know, caught and corrected really in the hardware. And maybe that's more than we want to pay for if we have algorithms that could, by being informed of many other things, uh, catch and correct uh, some of those errors uh, in software. Power may be cycled on or off as we get close to the heat rejection limits of these systems based on compute schedules, perhaps schedules that the computer itself learns as it executes multiple iterations of some of these codes. All of this makes per node performance less reliable and therefore harder to load balance at scales of millions of cores. So I hope you begin to sense the challenges that come from this power uh, ceiling. Um, here's a fused multiply add. Uh, this is an example uh, that, Peter, uh, that uh, Thomas Schultes has used for a number of years. Um, and here you see, you know, on the left, uh, what looks like a lot, of, a lot of arithmetic going on, a lot of, uh, of flip-flops being done in, in uh, transistors. But actually, if you look at what takes more energy, dragging these four operands, the three inputs and the output, across this 20 millimeter die is an order of magnitude uh, more energy, according to uh, all the hardware uh, uh, studies by the year 2019, which is when this uh, study by Kogi et al. was done. By that time, the double precision fuse multiply add will cost only 11 picojoules, but moving the four arguments across the die will be an order of magnitude more expensive. This is, a, uh, this is some data from today's chips, not, not several years into the future, showing a two order of magnitude difference between the cost of today's floating point multiply add, approximately 10 times less efficient than the one we expect in 2019, but already um, you know, two orders of magnitude lower than moving a double precision word, not just across the die, but out into the network and across the system. Remember that a pico of anything, namely a picojoule, done exa per second is a mega. So if this is a picojoule, then it's a megawatt. And to do 100 of them, 
uh, at one exaflops is 100 megawatts, which represents the continuous power needs of about 71,000 people. And this doesn't count the cost of moving the data. This is just the flops of an exaflop system. So you can see, again, how uh, the future of algorithms is going to be very power driven and will really concentrate on minimizing communication and not just MPI based communication between logical processes, but even communication in a vertical sense among levels of cache. Now, as we've heard today from our Intel rep, Moore's law does not end, but Denard uh, scaling for MOSFETs does. And this goes back to his, 1960, uh, his 1972 paper, this is the inventor of DRAM, uh, who sh he showed that as you increase the doping by a factor of kappa, you can reduce the line width by a factor of kappa, and after everything multiplies out, um, you get uh, kappa squared more flops per square centimeter of silicon with the same power density. So this is the scaling that we've been riding all these years. But the same is not true of the copper. As you make it thinner, the resistivity goes up and eventually these asymptotes cross. And we've known for four decades that this was coming and finally it has hit. So some architectural trends, clock rates cease to increase. Well, arithmetic capability increases with concurrency, consistent with Moore's law. Memory storage capacity improves, but it diverges exponentially below arithmetic capacity. Transmission capability improves, but diverges exponentially below arithmetic capability. Mean time between hardware interrupt shortens, and billions of dollars, euros, whatever you like, of scientific software, uh, if it really wants to use a conceivable exascale architecture efficiently, will have to be redone to uh, address some of these uh, lacks of, of robustness and, and really synchronizability. I believe that node-based weak scaling uh, continues to be routine, but that's not the direction of the architecture. We have a lot of algorithms that defeat Amdahl's law in the sense that they have a constant communication to computation ratio as you increase the number of nodes while keeping the problem per node constant. You have n cubed of computing to do in a volume of matter and n squared communications around the perimeter, and that keeps the Amdahl penalty bounded if you can weak scale with a constant number of iterations. But that assumes that you, can, uh, that you have performance reliable nodes so that you can load balance with all those synchronizations. Meanwhile, the real challenge is usefully expanding the number of cores within a node to approximately uh, 10 to the third, while the memory and the memory bandwidth do not grow commensurately. And therefore, the challenge of moving to exascale doesn't need to wait for a system with you know, a billion gigahertz cores. You can look at a relatively small system and do the hard part, the on-node strong scaling. If you can do that, the weak scaling of gluing all those nodes together on a dragonfly or a torus kind of a network should not be a difficult issue. So my generation was the bulk synchronous programming generation. We've been at it for two to three decades been very successful at it if, if we could pat ourselves on the back for today's architectures. But you're going to spend most of your lives in the energy aware generation. And uh, this talk is an attempt to, to nudge you a little bit towards thinking about those issues, especially as you have two weeks ahead with all the experts that are coming uh, to town. So the, uh, the, the uh, concept of a bulk synchronous paral parallelism goes back longer than the paper that named it, but this paper has been around since uh, 1990. I believe MPI started in 1992, but uh, people were doing communicating sequential processes, bulk synchronous processing, uh, uh, single program, multiple data form of parallelism uh, you know, for, for some time before. Most uh, simulations implemented at what we could call commodity petascale today or infra, infra petascale are iterative methods based on domain decomposition, either of mesh points or of particle observers or what have you, and a message passing. The data structures have to be distributed. There's no processor that can hold a view of the entire domain. Each individual processor works on a subdomain, exchanges information at its boundaries in a lower dimensional sense relative to the computation, and hopefully um, the number of iterations to mediate either equilibrium or some stability check on that evolving system uh, is bounded as the problem size grows. And uh, both the computation and the neighbor communication are fully parallelized. The long distance communication is logarithmic and this all leads to successful uh, petascale computing if you can synchronize, if you have good load balance and good repeatable performance like the blue gene that we just heard about. 
So this is just a picture reminding us of the relative volume to surface ratios that make it all work. And uh, the history of the Gordon Bell Prize is really a, a testimony to the uh, legacy of bulk synchronous processing since the first prize was awarded in 1988. We've had this factor of 1,000 every 10 years on real applications, not just the LINPAC benchmark. And at the same time, in years when the Gordon Bell Prize has been awarded for cost performance, uh, we've seen nearly a factor of 1,000 per decade in, uh, you know, in that aspect as well. So it's really, there's no other technology in the history of the world that offers such improvements on such a regular basis, both in performance as if cost is no object and uh, constant performance at, at uh, decrease in cost. And as a result, of course, science and engineering have gone over from primarily experimental to, don you know, to, to increasingly uh, computational, at least to make the first cut before the experiments are done in a well-honed region of parameter space. However, these are exponentials. Exponential extrapolation is dangerous. Uh, uh, you know, every factor of 10, we break something. We heard that this morning. And uh, you know, scientific computing is at one of those crossroads where this, um, this beautiful uniformity in programming model that we've enjoyed for nearly three decades with the same assumptions about who takes care of what, a lot of which was relegated to hardware, and the same classes of algorithms, FFTs, multi-grid, domain decomposition, uh, fast multipole, um, all of these things have to be re-examined uh, in the light of new architectures. Now, exascale looks qualitatively different and more difficult. Well, we once said that about a message passing. A Rusty will remember when message passing was too hard for normal programmers uh, to do. Uh, but, um, you know, we will confront it to maintain relevance. And I would say that it is not a distraction, not a fly to be whisked away, but an intellectual stimulus. And whatever we improve towards the power austerity and the latency hiding and the bandwidth, uh, uh, you know, improvements for exascale will filter down to all the power aware designs that we need, for instance, to do airplane design, you know, on one of these. Because when you get exascale in the national labs, you get petascale in the ICU operating room of your hospital to do real-time surgery planning, and you get terascale on your cell phone. And so it's really the spin-offs from the, the power-aware technology that will be a greatest benefit. But meanwhile, uh, it's the science that's driving it. That's what Obama said last Tuesday when he signed the exascale uh, bill. And uh, so there are... Uh, you know, I would say the journey is going to be as much fun as the destination. So the main challenge going forward from an algorithm's point of view is that almost all of our good methods in linear algebra, in differential equations, integral equations, signal analysis, they require frequent synchronizing global communication. We love inner products. We love projections, norms. We, we love to evaluate fresh global residuals. And these are, if you will, addictive idioms for a mathematician. Already at about 100,000 processors, these begin to tax what we can synchronize well. They can even be fragile for smaller concurrency if we're going to go adaptive. And concurrency, as we know, is in the 3 million today and is heading towards billions of cores. Maybe not so many nodes, but a lot of cores uh, per node. Now, there are plenty of ideas to adapt or substitute for our favorite solvers with methods that pursue these exascale algorithmic agendas. And I list four of them here. Reduce synchrony, let's synchronize less often, either in frequency or in global span. If we synchronize frequently but it's more local, that's less of a hit. Uh, we have to have greater arithmetic intensity, that's the ratio of flops executed per bytes transferred. Uh, we need greater SIMD style, shared memory concurrency, because SIMD is power efficient, as we've heard all morning long. We don't have branch prediction and out of order execution and all these very expensive modes of latency reducing computing. We have a, a throughput-based style that's very power efficient per flop if we can recast the algorithms in that mode. And we'll have to build more resilience or we will actually be invited to build more resilience and even invite the, the vendors you know, to make less reliable hardware that's more power efficient when we know how to take care of some of those faults, just as we take care of quadrillions of rounding errors per second today on systems that are iterated for weeks because we have stability analysis of, uh, uh, in, you know, in, in linear algebra and, and PDEs. There may be many other forms of statistical averaging, machine learning, uh, you know, to, to detect errors and, uh, and, and put less burden on the hardware for that. 
So programming models and runtimes will have to be stretched to accommodate these algorithmic design points, and everything should be on the table for trades, and this is the philosophy of the Department of Energy's co-design uh, um, uh, campaign. Now, I have to warn you, because I've given this talk and been burned at the podium by people who insist that vendors will never build non-reliable hardware. It wouldn't work for banks, and you know, scientific computing is that 1% that's not worth pitching to. Uh, I would say the first two of these uh, algorithmic pillars are completely non-controversial. We need algorithms that reduce synchrony and that have greater arithmetic intensity. That will benefit the entire uh, spectrum of computing, uh, and it will be necessary at the exascale. Uh, this aspect of going to greater SIMD style shared memory concurrency really puts the solvers community in the lead. The question is, will the fusion community follow? Will the atmospheric community follow? Will the chemistry community follow? You know, with Amdahl's law, if all you improve is the solvers and you don't move the rest of your code onto the GPUs or the, or the Intel Phi's, uh, will you really uh, be able to use the exascale systems that well? Well, uh, I think it's historical. Uh, going back to vectors, that sol the solvers community are the first marines on the beach. They set up the good data structures and uh, the good you know, paradigms that, that then the applications people learn to use. Uh, the last one, I, I, I admit, is controversial. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to the idea that, uh, that we should encourage less reliable computing for the sake of more power efficient computing, but I think it's a great research opportunity at the very least. <coughs> so, I have uh, five slides of bad news, good news. And if I get through these five slides, and you can take my examples on faith, and Paul can cut me off at any time. But after this, I, I, I go you know, to a long list of, of short examples. So uh, we will have to explicitly control more of the data motion. Why? Because as we've noted, it carries the highest energy cost, and it also carries the highest time cost in uh, the exascale environment. The good news is we'll get the tools, the, the programming paradigms, to control that part of the data motion that we don't already control through MPI, namely the replication vertically in cache and registers. Uh, and, you know, th this is um, until recently not in our purview. Now with you know, rolling data in and out of GPU DRAM, uh, you know, we, we have certain uh, beginnings of this. We can you know, insist in C constructs that certain you know, data not be cached or whatever. There, there's a small amount of control we have. We'll get much more of this kind of control. Uh, optimal formulations and algorithms may lead to poorly proportioned computations for exascale hardware resource balances. Today's optimal methods presume flops are expensive and memory and memory bandwidth are cheap. And as that reverses, we'll be lured into maybe different ways of formulating the same fundamental physics. Maybe um, lattice Boltzmann might be better than, uh, than mesh-based PDEs. I'm just, you know, just throwing that one out as one example of the rethinking that may be done. Uh, fully hardware reliable executions may be regarded as too costly and synchronization vulnerable. So this new uh, research topic of algorithmic based fault tolerance uh, will be uh, cheaper than hardware operating system mediated reliability. I project that we will partition both our code uh, in the sense of subroutines and our data in the sense of you know, different uh, uh, data structures into two sets. A small set that must be done reliably implemented on ECC memory with today's grade of, of uh, arithmetic uh, quality, and a large set that can be done fast and unreliably and very uh, you know, cheaply in terms of energy, knowing that the errors can be detected or their effects rigorously bounded. An example of the latter is applying a preconditioner. Um, you, know, you, can, uh, you can have an algorithm like FGM res, where the preconditioner varies from iteration to iteration, and if you've made an error in the preconditioner, you know, it, it can just be uh, just be put into the, the Krylov set, or you know, in taking a, um, a smoother in a multigrid, uh, you're, you're going to compute a fresh residual anyway. So if you have a delta spike, it will diffuse away quickly, and uh, you, you'll certainly be able to detect it. There are many examples already, and I believe Jack Dongara will talk about some um, methods in direct linear algebra, which is a little bit harder than iter iterative linear algebra to make robust, because each thing is only done once, and the residual isn't sort of constantly updated. But um, if you go back to the very foundations of computing, it wasn't reliable, and theoreticians uh, dealt with that. For instance, in implementing cellular automata, von Neumann wrote a paper on the synthesis of reliable organisms from unreliable components. We'll need to know a lot more statistics, and we'll be benefiting from uh, an, a discipline which was not known then, namely machine learning, in catching and fixing many of these errors. 
Another real shakeup for the algorithms community will be a motion away from the default use of uniform high precision in nodal bases on dense grids. That's the lazy way to get highly accurate answers. Um, that, uh, but, but that's expensive in storage and bandwidth. If you have a smooth function, it should be represented in a hierarchical basis or on sparse grids, many fewer bits uh, and, and storing nodal values for equivalent accuracy. And we should instead of when we communicate, say an update from one processor to another, we typically communicate the full double precision word rather than the change from the last time we communicated. If we're solving problems that are continuous in time, probably we're only changing you know, the low order uh, uh, digits in those uh, numbers. And we could uh, exploit that in, in uh, an appropriate uh, network. Um, and uh, equidistributing errors like these uh, to minimize resource use will lead to very many innovative uh, theses in numerical analysis. Finally, deterministic algorithms may be regarded as too synchronization vulnerable. If, if you know, we're waiting for missing data and 999,000 processors are ready to go, that processor that's missing may be persuaded to guess by extrapolating, maybe doing a Fourier time series of the last 100 messages from that processor that it received, uh, and rolling back if necessary. But um, you know, there's, there's a lot that we could exploit because of what we know mathematically about the problems that we're solving that we simply don't exploit today. We expect uh, the hardware to do everything uh, for us. <clears throat> so what will the first general purpose exaflops machines look like? Well, in hardware, there are many exciting paths, you know, memristors and, and uh, you know, optical uh, communication within the box and everything, but not commercially at scale within the decade, probably. We are, we're going to be looking for the first exascale machine at, a, at probably, um, you know, CMOS-based uh, processors and MPI plus X as the programming model, where X may be one of the things that you've heard about today, or it may be MPI itself to give you very uh, tight control over memory allocation uh, within a node just as you have in buffers to store messages between nodes. My philosophy is that algorithms will be the things that adapt to span this increasing gulf between aggressive applications that most of you are working on, according to last night, and the austere architectures that you've heard about today that are getting more, more so. And I regard this as a full employment program. Uh, this, is not a, uh, this is not a burden, this is fun. And you can already look at the kind of of new postdocs that are being generated at the labs that are receiving the next generation IBM NVIDIA and Cray uh, uh, you know, Phi uh, systems, and IBM itself uh, with its data-centric systems initiative. There's a lot of, uh, of you know, posted uh, jobs for uh, making these transitions for, for important codes. Now this is the required software, probably it's just a short list. Um, you know, there's model-related software that probably most of us in this room concentrate on since most of you are computational science engineers. Then there's the development related stuff that, um, you know, debuggers, how do you debug a, a billion core system? How do you profile it? How do you, um, you know, do good source to source translations to be, you know, to match the architecture at the bottom end and, and try to hide some of the evolution from the programmer. And then there's the production related software uh, when you actually have something that is scientifically and computationally correct and you want to run it like a scientific instrument. And high-end computers come with very little of this stuff, as you know. Most of it has to be invented by, by DOE first as the buyer. And my own small area is solvers and integrators, and I hope that uh, during the week, you know, you'll hear about many other such efforts and that you will be enlisted to build some of this new software. We have to start with optimal algorithms because it doesn't make sense to go to exascale with any other kind of algorithm. We can't have an order n squared algorithm if memory is scaling more weakly uh, you know, uh, than, uh, than everything else. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we are running longer and longer uh, times uh, rather than constant time as we add uh, memory and processing power towards the exascale. The most we can tolerate uh, is an n log n kind of algorithm, and there are many such good algorithms in the solvers community. In fact, every decade we seem to invent one. We have FFTs, multi-grid, fast multipole, sparse grids, hierarchical matrices. Notice that your generation's contribution is still missing after 2000. My, my hypothesis is that 
you're going to invent some good data mining algorithm that will be more optimal than the ones we have today. A field in which the complexities aren't even that well understood in most cases. You know, is it the size of the number of entries, the size of the number of queries, the size of the number of links? Nobody really has a good idea there, but I think there's a lot of interesting uh, optimal algorithms coming from there. One of our early graduating students at, at Kaust got the message. He said, with great computational power comes great algorithmic responsibility. So, recap of my agenda. These are the four pillars of algorithmic evolution. Greater arithmetic intensity, including assured accuracy with less floating point precision if possible. Reduced synchronization and communication, less frequent and or less global. Greater SIMD style concurrency, algorithmic resilience. Then quantification of trades between limited resources and all the things that you really came to HPC to do, to do optimization, all these post-forward problems, data assimilation, parameter inversion, uncertainty quantification, to make computational science a science rather than just a, a, a way to, to uh, corroborate with experiments. So now, um, I don't know uh, what time is, is remaining, but I will uh, you know, dash through a number of examples where one or more of these algorithmic drivers is you know, put in the, in the forefront in, uh, in these uh, different um, you know, ideas. So I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, we are a um, uh, accelerator agnostic uh, research center. We have both uh, the, uh, the NVIDIA GPU center and the Intel uh, IPCC as of recently and the Cray Center of Excellence. Um, so the dominant consumers in applications that tie up the major supercomputer centers like ALCF and TAC and, and the like, NERSC, um, a lot of it is linear algebra on dense symmetric or Hermitian matrices. Where does that come? It comes from Schrodinger's equation fundamentally, you know, all the chemistry and materials things, whether it shows up as DFT or whatever. Um, you have also reduced Hessians in optimization problems. Those become dense because they're reduced. And you have covariance matrices, especially in geospatial statistics, where we're now seeing it quite common to correlate tens or hundreds of thousands, for instance, of temperature points in the sea surface or whatever. Um, then there's Poisson solves, which are the highest order operator in many PDEs in fluid or solid mechanics, the, the pressure constraint in incompressible flow, the diffusive term that comes up in, in Maxwell equations, um, density functional theory, molecular dynamics, et cetera. It's even the dominant term in, in the Schrodinger equation. So these are two of the major thrusts uh, of the Extreme Computer Research Center. What about dense linear algebra? How can we reduce synchrony and increase concurrency? Um, we're going to see a lot of, uh, you're going to, when Jack talks to you, I'm sure he's going to talk a lot about directed acyclic graph data flow implementations of the traditional scala pack library of which he and Jim Demmel have been the custodians uh, for these many years. Here's a, a, a Hermitian generalized Eigen problem, which traditionally is broken down into four steps. You Cholesky factor the B matrix, you apply its inverse factors to the A to get a regular Eigen problem. Then you do a tridiagonal reduction and a QR iteration to extract the eigenvalues and, if wanted, the eigenvectors. And if you apply this to a little four by four system, then the three main uh, uh, flops consuming steps of this can be graphed like this, where time is down and concurrency is, is the breadth of the diagram. And, and the little arrows show the data dependencies, starting in the upper left hand corner. And if you call an LA pack, you know, a collection of routines to solve this problem. Then you first solve this one, then you solve this one, then you solve this one. But a better way is to recognize the global data uh, uh, directed acyclic graph of this data flow problem and expand the concurrency and shrink the cumulative uh, vertical breadth of this by following this compute schedule. And uh, this uh, can be implemented very well, for instance, on GPUs with something called a tile algorithm. And to illustrate with a recent uh, thesis that we, that we graduated, the student now works in Jack's lab at ICL at Tennessee. Uh, he built a BLAS2 uh, library for GPUs with coalesced memory accesses, double buffering, and a polyalgorithmic approach to breaking up the problem based on the block size. And uh, this is a plot of matrix dimensions. So these, these are dense, this is a dense Cholesky solver in this case. Same thing has been done for Eigen solvers. And this is uh, flops, so up is good. And this was the previous version of Kublas, and this is Magma Blas. And uh, let's see, uh, this one of them is Kula, uh, contributed code. And this was, uh, this was Ahmad's uh, K Blas uh, code. And this is on one GPU. 
and this is the KBLAS on up to eight GPUs uh, in a box, and you see that as the problem size is sufficiently large, there's almost linear scaling in this DAG-based tile algorithm implementation. And this is now in KUBLAS 6.0 and beyond. So you get it for free. Uh, it's been applied in the European, uh, in, in, in simulations of the European Extremely Large Telescope, which has tens of thousands of mirrors, each a couple of centimeters, that have to be correlated based on atmospheric turbulence to correct the, uh, the uh, light rays coming from distant objects. And they need to do real-time computing with uh, these, these Cholesky solvers, and they want to move to a GPU-based system. And uh, the, the kernel is, is a Cholesky solve, but we're now working on many other levels of that software stack. And again, you see this, this theme of, of uh, combining the individual routines into a single uh, DAG. These could either be pre-scheduled or they could be dynamically scheduled, depending on the overheads, the problem size, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the hardware that you're running on. What about sparse linear algebra? How can we increase the arithmetic intensity and increase the concurrency? I go back to a problem that I used to work on here at Argonne with Bill Gropp and Barry Smith in the founding years of Petsy, where we implemented an unstructured, in fact, the original, the original unstructured uh, data structure in Petsy and the original Newton Krylov solver were motivated by working on this code, which was a uh, compressible or incompressible uh, aircraft design code from NASA. And recently, working with Intel Bangalore, we ported this to multi-core chips for shared memory scaling. And this is the compilation out of the box of the original code for a certain number of time steps. So up is, up is seconds. And uh, this is uh, the speed up on a 10-core, um, 20-thread 20 20 um, Ivy Town uh, chip. And you can see that the flux computation is reduced by the full factor of 20. This is this is you know, really um, sort of uh, easy to, easy to uh, parallelize and, and by a good coloring algorithm uh, decouple the, um, the data dependencies. The ILU uh, and the triangular back solves of the preconditioner are much harder to find good concurrency within a node. And these are constructions of gradients and Jacobians. This is the overall code as, a, as sort of a linear combination of these various tasks, each one of which has its own strategy for uh, implementation. Um, what about uh, fast multipole for Poisson solves? We can do three things. We can increase the arithmetic intensity, reduce the synchrony, and increase the concurrency. Arithmetic intensity is a real uh, you know, sort of embarrassment to many of today's uh, chips, which were designed to win on the LINPAC benchmark and uh, are really poor on, on uh, for instance, Krylov methods. So on the x-axis here is plotted the operational intensity, flops per byte. For instance, the sparse matrix vector multiply, suppose you have y equals ax, y and x are cached, a has to be dragged in from memory. So each element of a is used once in two floating point uh, operations, so you have a quarter of a flop per, eight, you know, per, per word, if you will. Uh, sorry, a quarter of a flop per byte uh, with those eight byte words. Um, uh, if you have constant coefficients, uh, you can do a little better. If you have 3D FFT, and so forth. This is the DGEM. This is the standard Lil Impact benchmark uh, thing, which, which uh, you know, has a larger number of uh, flops per byte. And the other three lines here are different phases within the uh, multipole algorithm, some based on the spherical expansion, some based on the Cartesian expansion. And what you see graphed above these you know, algorithmic dimensionless numbers, if you will, are the real uh, you know, performance data for a collection of, of current uh, you know, uh, chips, and this is the area in which they are communication limited, where they're memory bandwidth bound, and this is the area where you want to operate, where you're actually using all the, 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 the cores that you, that you paid for. Um, now, you could argue that, you know, since memory bandwidth is expensive, you should be happy to operate down here and, and ignore the cores that you can't use most of the time as just an engineering optimization for those rare times when you can use them since they're cheap anyway. But since they are cheap, why not drive algorithms into this range that, that exploits them if you can thereby reduce the, the uh, energy spent uh, elsewhere? So these are you know, a couple of orders of magnitude really to play with. And fast multipole accomplishes this, of course, by a hierarchical reduction of clustering together remote uh, sources, uh, uh, you know, for, for targets, and, you know, not every one of these points need to be communicated individually in an n-squared algorithm, but they can be hierarchically expanded, 
and then re-expanded locally, and, and you move very little data, and you keep almost all the accuracy. You can tune that. And of course, it's done recursively in an awk tree in 3D. And if you look at the, the, what comes to this uh, set of target particles from this original set of sources, each uh, set of, of sources comes over at a different granularity depending on how far away it was from the target that you're looking for. And the good news is this is just a direct summation. All of these horizontal uh, transformations of data can occur concurrently and asynchronously. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, freedom from, from synchronization here, high arithmetic intensity, uh, or only log p messages, uh, only uh, order n arithmetic concurrency. It's tunable in the sense that you can use um, larger patches with higher order or smaller patches with lower order expansions. So if you have a, th a warp with 32 in it, you could you know, say that's, that's going to govern what polynomial I want in my... Uh, in my um, you know, expansions or whatever. Uh, fast multiball has been inside of eight Gordon Bell Prizes. It's been very effectively implemented on GPUs because of its uniformity, but it's fragile. It's based on knowing the Green's function. Um, still, it's, uh, it could be used as a preconditioner for a more general elliptic operator. It beats the pants off of FFT in weak scaling uh, because FFT does all these uh, 3D uh, transposes in, in principle. I know there are some new ideas there, of course, uh, FFT is such a key algorithm that there have to be new ideas, but this was uh, you know, a real test on, on, uh, on the, uh, which machine? I think it was, um, uh, this was on Tsubame at, in Japan. Uh, what about using you know, the FMM for this operator on this diffusive operator, maybe with some spatial uh, dependence? Um, we have a fast way of, of solving this. And we could uh, use that as a preconditioner inside of a Krylov iteration for that. There is this drag of having to get in finite boundary conditions, but they can be implemented by a BEM method in low order complexity. And it's this, it's this um, you know, Poisson uh, interior forcing term inversion here that we implement in order n. And this is a, a strict you know, forward multiply kind of a preconditioner. There's no recursive ILU or relaxation method. Uh, it's like, in that sense, like the sparse approximate inverse, but much cheaper, more concurrency, more intensity, less synchrony than these other famous preconditioners. And in fact, uh, it runs pretty evenly with multigrid on a, um, you know, on a, on a uh, you know, sort of per iteration basis. These, the, uh, the um, red, blue, and green are FMM at different levels of accuracy, going to a rather weak one out here, taking a few more iterations. This is AMG and, and geometric multigrid, and this is ILU with an incomplete uh, Cholesky, just to show. And what about the cost per iteration? Um, the solid curves are the uh, FMM, so it sets up quicker, but executes per step slower because of the big constant than AMG, which is somewhere in the middle. So AMG looks like it should be better for a Krylov method that takes many iterations, but in fact, if you, if you do strong scaling, then eventually AMG runs out of, of, of a strong scaling, whereas FMM plunges through a little bit longer. And asymptotically, we're going to be doing a lot more strong scaling. Um, what about making fast multipole algebraic? Forget about using it as a preconditioner. Can we actually make it algebraic, like we've made multigrid algebraic? And the key tool here is hierarchical matrices, which is a, a mathematical invention from uh, the year 1999, which represents uh, a matrix coming from typical integral or differential operators uh, in a low rank form, where all the off diagonal blocks, instead of being stored as they are, are re expanded in SVDs. And so you keep a small number of basis vectors per block. You can have, uh, just as an example of, of uh, for a 1D Laplacian, you can see that this off diagonal block has rank one. Well, you might as well store it sparsely. But its inverse also has rank one. That's a theorem. And you can store this huge, dense piece of a Green's function with just, you know two vectors in, the, in this case of constant coefficients. In the more case of variable coefficients, you might need a higher basis uh, in both column and row for that. Um, there's a, there's a uh, vocabulary of strong and weak in hierarchical matrices. Uh, namely, if you want to use only low rank, you have to keep subdividing as you go towards the diagonal. If you're willing to use high rank, uh, you can go all the way uh, to the diagonal, uh, and that's called weak uh, admissibility. In any event, um, we wanted to implement uh, the hierarchical matrix on top of the octree data structure of FMM, especially of the EXA FMM code 
of Rio Yakota, and you can see how hierarchically um, you, you subdivide uh, these off-diagonal blocks. These can stay large, these are a little smaller. The closer you get to the diagonal, the smaller they are. You keep the original diagonal blocks at full rank. And all these off-diagonal blocks are SVD'd, and the bases that represent them can be, in fact, hierarchically nested. So the basis for these two blocks can be derived from the basis for that block with a little, a little QR. And you'll hear Jim Demmel probably talk about tall, skinny QR, which is a very optimal algorithm for doing stuff just exactly like this. So you can move your original algorithm into this sufficient, uh, this is a very complicated data structure. I mean, running to a GPU with all these little pieces and putting them in the right place and distributing over network, non-trivial programming task. And in fact, um, you know, the Kublaz doesn't have uh, this yet. Uh, but uh, we're, you know, we're trying to add it as, as one of its, uh, you know, as, as a good um, uh, piece of functionality for the core of a lot of, of dense matrices that arise maybe as you're doing some kind of a supernodal elimination and the, the matrices get denser as you, as you work towards uh, the bottom right-hand corner and then at some point you say, forget storing this as a dense matrix, I'm going to store it as a hierarchical matrix and save on space and flops. And indeed, the matrix vector multiply which uh, consists of keeping the diagonal blocks, this i, j, and d, doing them literally, and, and doing this uh, SVD implemented multiply for all the off-diagonal blocks looks just like a fast multipole. You do the up sweep, and then you, you move the multipoles, and then you do the down sweep, and you've applied the matrix everywhere. And so we have some initial results for uh, fast matrix vector multiply on GPUs where uh, we have several different implementations based on MKL, Kusparse, our own KBLAS, and something we're working on now called HICMA. And this is the GPU sustained bandwidth. This is not an algorithm that's me memory bandwidth friendly, if this were a dense uh, matrix even, because of the problems mentioned earlier. But um, we, can, you know, we can get rather close to the, to the, uh, the bandwidth peak with these hierarchical uh, methods. Nonlinear preconditioning. Um, we often have to solve implicitly f of u equals zero, where f and u have dimension, let's say, 100 million. Maybe they come from some fluid mechanics discretization on a mesh, and they represent the conservation laws. Um, let's take a two-component example, x1 and x2. Um, we might have a, a, you know, a merit function, a, a, a norm of the residual of this uh, nonlinear function that looks sort of like this, and Newton's method won't work well until it gets into this domain where everything is sort of hyperellipsoidal. Outside of this, you have to use continuation and trust region, all kinds of tricks to globalize Newton's method. That's one problem with nonlinear solvers. The other problem is uh, that the linear problems may themselves be ill-conditioned. If these were perfect circles, conjugate gradients would converge in one step. But if we try to attack a problem like this with an unpreconditioned Krylov method, we'll take a lot of small steps, normal to, maybe normal to each of these curves or whatever, but it'll take a, a long time to get into that uh, center. We can do a nonlinear preconditioning which attacks both of these uh, problems. Um, the, and, and originally, this was invented for mathematical reasons, for robustness of Newton's method. It turns out that it's great for exascale, we think, because it breaks up most of the global synchronization of the original Newton Krylov algorithm and replaces it with local problems in the uh, process of doing the nonlinear preconditioning. So there's still global synchronization in a few outer steps, hopefully many fewer than required by the original Newton. And here is a, a, a sort of a compact description of the algorithm. You want to solve this problem. This is the original coordinates. You create an equivalent nonlinear problem with the same root, and you create that by doing local solves. Namely, you restrict the original problem to a subdomain, and you change only the unknowns in that subdomain, keeping everybody else the same. And you do this over all the subdomains, and you add up all these little corrections, these little delta corrections within each subdomain. That gives you a new nonlinear function of the original uh, point you're at. And it turns out that this has the same root as that. It's easy to see if this goes to 0, that the corrections were 0 and you've solved the original root. The reciprocal requires the usual uh, uh, Jacobian continuity uh, kinds of things. And um, so it's, it's a method that um, you know, can be proved to, to work superlinearly uh, in the neighborhood of Newton. And it, it does a lot of globalization sort of for free. And this is an example on a, a reservoir model where uh, at each time step, represented here as the number of days of evolving the reservoir, we have an implicit Newton problem to solve. And if we do it with a global Newton Krylov method, the number of Newton iterations, even initialized from a previous good time step, can be rather large. But with the nonlinear preconditioning, they level out and are, are quite uh, reliable. 
And this is an example not of the additive domain decomposed version of preconditioned inexact Newton, but a multiplicative version where instead of breaking up into subdomains, we break up into fields like the velocities, the vorticities, or whatever. And uh, this has a, a, a very good um, strong scaling on a driven cavity uh, problem. For, uh, my only comment about multiphysics will be that um, we, we don't want to uh, partition a multiphysics problem in ways that use you know, this part of a multiprocess and this part and this part because that's too much data motion. As we move towards exascale, we'll want to tightly integrate uh, things that are geographically nearby. And as we move towards non-reliable processors, we'll have to do locally sort of NUMA aware work stealing in order to uh, keep that uh, going. This is actually a slide by Bill Grob. And um, this has been looked at by a large We the People DOE uh, committee as well. Um, and so to sort of summarize, how will PDE computations adapt? The program model will still be dominantly message passing, adapted to multi-core hybrid processors beneath a relaxed synchronization MPI-like interface. Load balance blocks will be scheduled today, but instead of nested loop structures, we'll separate them into critical and non-critical parts and schedule the critical parts with DAGs, with one of these new runtimes, like Rusty will talk about in a couple of days, ADLB. And the non-critical parts will be made available for NUMA-aware work stealing. Um, we will create separate threads for separate logical tasks, almost as if we were writing an operating system, join priority threads in a graph. And a typical Newton Krylov step, which looks like this, is on the critical path, but all these subroutines are not. And yet we do that we schedule them that way today because that's the way you know, we've, we've just been, been taught. But we have to think again, um, you know, as we were being told today, <laughs> really by James, uh, well, what are the fundamental parallel abstractions rather than you know, uh, how do we take advantage of existing programming languages. So there are many sources of non-uniformity today. TLB misses will spoil your synchronization, for example. But uh, there are newly important ones coming from next generation hardware. And they all look the same at a synchronization point to these kinds of hard non-uniformities that we deal with as applications people. So if we can move to this new paradigm of NUMA-aware work stealing to aid um, you know, synchronization uh, hiding, if you will, then it will help on both the hardware and the software side. I've only scratched the surface of creative ideas that uh, your colleagues in, in the DOE labs and DOE-funded university partners are doing. I would invite you to go to uh, this URL, if it's still hosted here at Argonne, and look at some of these white papers, each of which could be a PhD uh, thesis topic. Pete showed this slide this morning. I love it. <laughs> I also uh, would supplement it with this slide. Um, <laughs> user-controlled data replication will give way to system, uh, sorry, a system will give way to user-controlled, system-controlled error handling to user-controlled because not all errors are, are critical. H default high precision to adaptive variable precision, computing directly with quantities of interest to computing with the deltas. Uh, Low-order discretizations will be replaced with much more arithmetically intensive high-order discretizations, default full rank by exploiting low rank because most of our nice differential integral operators have low rank representations. And a great algorithmic theme is, since we have the curses of dimensionality in multiple scales, we need to take advantage of every blessing we have. And we have blessings. We have continuity and low rank that we don't use enough. And that's with that, I will end my talk. Thank you. When you talked about arithmetic intensity, that is defined as the number of flops over the total bytes transferred. Correct. Now, what do you mean by total bytes transferred? From cache to CPU or from memory to? T typically, um, the, the denominator is taken as the bytes transferred from DRAM to, to the CPU. So ev you know, everything going through. But you could apply it at multiple levels. It, it's essentially a two-level concept. But you, know, you, you could apply it, let's say, Register recursively. Register to cache, yeah. cache to yeah. cache, yeah. cache to. This, this original um, so-called roof line diagram from Berkeley, I think, was based on DRAM and, and cores. Yeah. And so what, why, I guess my second part is what question, why do you want to hire AI? Is it because you maximize the... Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, if, if you think of, of you know, the, um, if, if we think traditionally of the resources of the system being built around the floating point processing power, then it seems a waste not to use it. Now, many people have argued, I, I believe with a lot of merit, that we shouldn't worry about those extra cores we're not using. They were cheap to build. They don't cost any power when we're not using them. And we're using that expensive resource, namely the memory bandwidth at its peak. 
So maybe that's the way we should measure the merit of that implementation. But you know, the, as long as those other cores are sitting there doing nothing, aren't there algorithms that we could try that use those extra cores in order to you know, reduce memory uh, transfers or synchronization points or whatever elsewhere? It's just, it's just a new sort of free resource that has to be used to, to make up for all the bad things that are happening. All the different things that are happening. <laughs> uh, other questions? It was there because of Linpack. Maybe it will go away <laughs> under HPCG. <laughs> yeah. There's one over here. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have a question about, uh, you, uh, you mentioned a lot about these libraries and uh, the end of the talk. And I, I, was, I was wondering if the... Uh, you mean the runtime? The runtime libraries? Uh, yeah. No. I mean, uh, no, no. I, I'm just talking, uh, we're talking about some algorithm. Here. Okay. Um, I, I was wondering if, if it's true then, um, how can you comment? You know, can you comment about the particle methods and continuum based method? Which 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 kind of uh, method that you think probably uh, perform? Um, well, among the particle based methods, there are those that are restricted to lattices, and then there are, you know, some of the other, uh, you know, the particles just that just float freely on a you know on a Newton's law trajectory from time step to time step. I'm not an expert in in these various uh, methods myself. Um, I, I know that they're traditionally handled in the same way as mesh-based methods in the sense that you partition the total number of particle observers into equal size sets and you give them each their own dynamics and they have to be exchanged at boundaries. So they have many similarities, although they're much less structured in general. Um, uh, I, you know, so, someone, someone who's an expert in, in the particle side uh, should actually uh, you know, look at that, look at that problem, the PPM methods or whatever. Thank you.